bells ring Do they make you think of me? You and me inside the sacristy With the wafers and the wine My blood pumping like the organ Holding Bibles in our hands You, the Canaan land Forbidden and fine When I hear the bells of St. Jude They make me think of you And all the pretty birds that flew From your mouth into mine My swallows almost set to singing Sparrows almost took to wing but if they knew anything, it's that God's eyes were on them all the time. You said the red velvet played with the quarters. Let's take them. We'll build ourselves a house on the hill. from our own well In the hollers in the badlands In the missionary van You dressed up and you sunburned I hid under mine And in the evenings at the altar Father taught us how to pray For all the soul sick and the sinners You grinned at me You said That's you and I You said the red velvet played with the quarters Let's take them We'll build ourselves a house on the hill and We can draw the holy water Water from our own well When God spoke to Samuel Do you think it sounded like the Benedict? We drank a wicked wine But really you, you were an apple Me, I was a dove Eating manna from above I guess you knew that all the time You know the red velvet played with the quarters I took them, I built myself a house on the hill Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. I'm the Reverend Jim Fody, and I am honored to serve as your assistant sabbatical minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all you are carrying with you today and all your heart longs to set down. We welcome people watching online and people participating in person. We are streaming this service live. 
For those of you in the room, the blue tape on the floor near the back indicates the seats that are in view of the camera. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests this morning. If you are visiting us today, please, we invite you to fill out a welcome card located in the pew rack in front of you, and you can drop it in the offering basket later in the service. Please join us for a social hour after the service across the hall in the Lean House Common Room, which is out this door. Folks can find hearing assist devices and large print hymnals and orders of service at the back of the sanctuary. And there are worship activity bags for children and those young at heart. If you're watching online, YouTube has closed captioning available. You can enable that function on the device you're using to watch the service. Please, please let us know if you have any trouble accessing the closed captions. We have a few announcements to highlight this morning, and all of them are related to next Sunday, May 21st. As you may know, it's Religious Education Sunday, and we're trying something new by having only one worship service, only at 11 a.m. next Sunday. We're doing this so that our young children don't have to stay at church for two worship services. While there will be no service at 9, the sanctuary will be open for quiet reflection starting at 9, and we will have our usual forum and coffee hour at 10 a.m. So please join us at 11 a.m. next Sunday for our multi-generational celebration of religious education. Then, beginning at 1245 next Sunday, 1245 in the afternoon, First Church's annual meeting will be held both in our sanctuary and via Zoom. Come learn about First Church's accomplishments over the 2022-23 church year. Get information about our financial situation. Vote on new Board of Trustees and nominating committee members. And hear from the task force that is setting up the new Forge Our Future Endowment Fund. Child care is available in the preschool and nursery during the meeting. No sign up is required for that. Members should watch their email for additional details and a Zoom sign up for the meeting itself. And for the time between the end of next Sunday's worship service and the beginning of the meeting, please consider bringing a food item to share with everyone. Sign up at the RE table during today's coffee hour. Sweet treats and savory snacks will be most welcome for everyone participating in this big day at First Church. I now welcome you to our worship service by inviting you to join me in a unison affirmation of our mission, which is printed on your order of service. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Our opening words today are by the Reverend Marcus Liefert. O oh, you who are makers, makers of beauty, of paintings and pottery and sculpture, blessed is the making. You who make with hands and hearts and minds, who make out of breath and bones and blood human lives, Blessed are the makers. Blessed are those who make us laugh, who make jokes and faces and toys. Blessed are those who make messes, who make trouble and make friends, and when needed, make up. Blessed are those who make do, who make it last, make it work, make beds and make time for others. Blessed are those who make love, who make out and make more and make mistakes. Blessed are those who make coffee and tea, who make conversation, who make meaning in the face of tragedy, who make merriment and awaken joy. Blessed are those who make peace, for they shall inherit the earth. Will you please now rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn number 212 in the gray hymnal. We are dancing Sarah's circle.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeders, honored as always to serve as your associate minister. We have a child dedication ceremony today, which brings us much joy. In Unitarian Universalism, we believe every child is born an original blessing. Each child comes into the world like a flower in bud, beautiful in this stage of their life and with the potential to grow. This cannot happen alone. Like a flower, every child needs loving nurture, fresh air, rich soil, clear rain, sunny days, and restful nights. In our child dedication ceremonies, we commit ourselves to their lives by making promises to one another. Will the parents dedicating their children please come up to the chancel at this time and stand behind the table? These children's first teachers of truth and examples of love are their parents. Parents, in bringing your children to be dedicated today, will you affirm that your child is a blessing entrusted in your care and that you intend to do all you can to provide your child with roots so that they may feel safe and with wings so that they may fly? Will you strive to share with your child a reverence for life's beauty, truth, and goodness? If so, please say, we will. We will. Will the extended families of these children please rise in body and spirit? You are the next circle of support for these children and their parents. In coming here to be part of their dedication today, Will you affirm that you will support them in this adventure of life, hold them in love and compassion, and be additional sources of learning and love for them as they grow? If so, please say, we will. Children cannot fully grow into their unique potential alone or only with the devotion of their parents and families. Children need a community in which to grow, so we have some promises to ask of this community. To the children and youth, will the children and youth please stand, rise in body and spirit? Will you promise to befriend these children and welcome them into our community? If so, please say, we will. Thank you. you be seated. Will the adult members and friends of our church please now rise in body and spirit? Will you welcome these families into our community and be with them in times of both struggle and gladness? Will you promise to delight in these children's accomplishments, share in their sorrows, and encourage them to grow into adulthood? If so, please say, we will. We will. Adam and Jessica, what are the full names you have given these children? Adela Jean Zeiger. Cecile Marie Zeiger. Adela Jean Zeiger. Cecile Marie Zeiger. We welcome you among us. Adela, we share with you the blessing of earth which gives life its shape. Cecile, we share with you the blessing of earth, which gives life its shape. We share with you the blessing of air, 
which gives life its breath. We share with you the blessing of water, which gives life the flow of emotion. And we share with you the blessing of fire, which gives life the spark of creation. Here is a rose, a symbol of life's unfolding, just as your life continues to unfold in beauty. And here is a certificate. I'll give it to Mom as a representation of the dedication of you both at this church. Megan and Jen, what are the full names you have given these children? Jasper Clayton Murray Bentz, Skylar Zuera Murray Bentz. Jasper Clayton Murray Bentz, Skylar Zuera Murray Bentz, we welcome you among us. We bless you with the element of earth which gives life its shape. And we bless you with the element of air, which gives life its breath. We bless you with the element of water, which gives life the flow of emotion. And you, we bless you with fire which gives life a spark of creation. This is a rose, a symbol of your beautiful life unfolding. <laughs> and here's also a certificate of their dedication at first church. May we all be worthy guardians of these young lives. May we build a community in which they will grow, surrounded by beauty and embraced by love. Let's give them all a round of applause. rise in body or spirit to sing the lullaby, Sleep My Child, Kim 409. During the second verse, children, youth, and RE volunteers will be invited across the hall to the common room for religious education.
We'll now enter a time of meditation, followed by silence, followed by the seated singing of Spirit of Life. I invite you to get comfortable in your seat, to relax your muscles, to close your eyes or soften your gaze, and ground yourself in this time and place. Our meditation today is the Mother's Day Litany by Amy Young. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this any harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, frustration, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience and sit with you. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have, had, who have aborted, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be partnered in mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is yet to be or not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who placed children up for adoption, we remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we journey with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ryan Palowski, and I am honored to serve as your worship associate this morning. At the age of 20, in 1981, my mother became a mother for the first time. Twelve years later, in 1994, she had her second child, me, and in 1997, her third and final child was born. For those of you who are counting, that is about 15 years of age difference between my brother in 1981 and my sister in 1997. And according to Dr. Gabor Mate, no two children are raised in the same family. And that is an understatement when there's a 15 year gap. My brother is on the cusp of being a Gen X or an elder millennial. I'm a full-fledged millennial, and my sister is bridging the millennial Gen Z divide. In what I've always found to be a funny twist of events, my mom had to decide between moving my brother into college in his freshman year dorm or come to my first day of grade school. <laughs> she ultimately chose to take him to college uh, he was the first person in the family to attend, and we had all attended grade school. <laughs> One unfortunate difference in the ways we were parented was whether our creativity was fostered and whether we were given all the tools needed to flourish. As a child, I would say I did the least flourishing. I did not fit into the traditional gender norms of a white, Polish, Irish, German, Catholic, working class household, and often had what creativity I did have stifled as a result. I distinctly remember my sister had the cutest little plastic toy purse filled with plastic toy purse items, and I loved playing with it. So much so that because I wanted to bring it everywhere, it had to go on the top shelf of the laundry room, where I couldn't reach it, but neither could my sister. My sister was a very traditional girl's girl, and my brother the traditional boy's boy that I was expected to be. I fell in the middle, but was given many cues that that wasn't an acceptable way to be. And at least in some respects, my family attempted to meet me halfway. When I expressed an interest in dolls, I would get G.I. Joes instead of Barbies, and a giant World War II era military base instead of the Barbie dream house that I really wanted. <laughs> Taken all together, despite the bumps and bruises, we three siblings have forged meaningful and happy lives for ourselves. But to this day, I still don't think of myself as very creative. And it was not until joining the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee that I had really had the ability to connect again with that child who could not flourish and begin to rewrite some of those mental scripts. I'm beginning to reclaim some of that lost creativity, whether I'm exploring art as a spiritual practice in the UU Wellspring small group program, or working to creatively reinterpret theologically triggering words from my past, or even in the UUA's extended leadership experience where I'm using my imagination to picture the struggles of our church's founders 180 years ago. I am so thankful for having found this community to truly nurture my spirit, engage my mind, and inspire me to action. Thank you. Learning what I already knew That I don't get to choose when or how Or why or who 
aspens quake and bodies break I could too I could too I already knew The in and out is all we get to keep Nose to throat to lung to heart To blood to rosy cheek Days go by in minutes The hours last a week The in and out is all we keep There's never been a spring that didn't come Winter sun, hammer tree and tap. That sap is gonna run, is gonna run, and spring is gonna come. We all gotta wash in the stream. is pure not one of us is clean every one of us is pure everyone's a holy dream a holy dream washed in the stream The fragile few Empires shake and bodies break And I love you I love you I already knew So, a bit of a confession. When I was first asked to give today's sermon, my gut reaction was, I'm a guy, I can't preach on Mother's Day. <laughs> Fortunately, my more thoughtful cognitive reaction to that gut reaction came pretty quickly, and I found myself both amused and curious to analyze my visceral response. I mean, right now, across this city, a majority of the pulpits are occupied by men preaching on Mother's Day. So it is neither illegal nor impossible. <laughs> I realized that what prompted my reaction was that in my previous ministry, I served with an amazing female-identified minister who is a mom and who wanted to speak on Mother's Day. And I was always grateful when she did. It just made sense. And what made sense this year was that the female-identified ministers here asked me to preach because they already had plenty to do leading up to today. So I'm grateful to be up here and grateful to have this opportunity to engage my creativity in a new way. Creativity is the Soul Matters theme for the month of May. And today we're exploring the ways that our creativity can find itself constrained by roles and labels. Sometimes others box us in, sometimes we box ourselves in. How can we break out of the confines that keep us from flourishing, keep us from engaging in the kinds of creativity that can be life-giving and life-sustaining? We just heard Ryan share with us the kinds of limits that existed around gender and his family of origin, what kinds of toys that he as a boy was expected and allowed to play with. He was drawn to a purple purse and the idea of a Barbie dream house. 
But he was denied those things, and they were deemed inappropriate. As many of you know and have perhaps experienced, his, his situation is not at all unique. I know that there are women in this room who wanted to wear pants or go to the hardware store in times and places where women and girls were discouraged from doing those things. I know that in this room there are men who were steered away from cooking or sewing or any number of creative activities that were stereotypically thought to be the province of females. Or perhaps those men steered themselves away from such activities out of a perceived need for safety. Sometimes it's other people and sometimes it's ourselves who keep us in the box. And sometimes even if we're ready and the people around us are ready, sometimes the broader world isn't ready for us to step out of the box and cross traditional lines. When I was about 11 or 12, I thought it would be cool if I could learn to tap dance like the guys I saw in old movies, performers like Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. So I went to check out a tap dance class run by the rec department in our town. I was the only boy there, perhaps the only boy who had ever been there. I remember being, the teacher being nice but not really prepared for a male student. The dance moves the girls in the class were doing seemed to my young mind more like the moves that a chorus line would do and not what Bing and Bob were doing. Being there felt awkward. And being there in my body felt awkward. And I never went back after that first class. My sister, meanwhile, continued to take classes at a local dance school. And over the years, I went to a few of the recitals, which were very long and featured hundreds of students. <laughs> the only males were in the audience. That was where we were supposed to be. And you know, this was not the 1700s. This was around 1980. And society, or at least the somewhat conservative little corner of it that was my world, didn't have a place for certain kinds of creative expression to flourish. I understand that things are better now, and I did eventually find ways to integrate dancing into my life, and I enjoy it to this day. But I do sometimes wonder how different my life, or at least my relationship with the movement of my body, might have been different if I had grown up in a less rigid time or place. Reflecting on my tap dance experience this past week, I thought of another box I wasn't entirely able to break out of while growing up. I participated in 4-H for a couple of years and I signed up for a cooking class. I was only moderately interested in cooking, but I've always been extremely interested in eating. <laughs> and cooking seemed like a helpful step. I was the only boy in that environment too, and I participated for I think a couple years. There weren't any awkward dance moves, and the 4-H groups met in people's homes, so there weren't any other guys around to see what I was doing. But I slid back into the box later in middle school, when every single person in shop class was male, and the only guy I could remember taking home ec was a football player who could get away with it without having his maleness questioned. My story is just one among many. Many of us from all kinds of backgrounds know what it's like to be in the audience and not allowed on the stage. The women in my life can offer countless examples from schools and workplaces, or just go to any Brewers, Bucks, or Packers game and see the millionaire males in the spotlight with women limited to spectator and supportive roles. Now, while I joke about being a man preaching on Mother's Day, the idea of women in the pulpit is actually quite new, a quite new and positive development in human history. The world is a mix of beautiful progress and plenty of stubborn boxes. Parenting, of course, has so much to do with it. The home or homes we spend our childhoods in can really set the stage for the flourishing of our creative selves. A few weeks ago, a sticker on the back window of a large family vehicle caught my eye. At the top, in large cursive letters, it said, raising, raising. The rest was in smaller print, so I had to look closely. And when I did, I could see what the whole thing said. Raising Jesus-loving, truth-seeking, free-thinking patriots. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I think there's a contradiction here. 
Each of these things, depending on how they're defined, can be quite good on their own. I know lots of people who love Jesus and are nourished by the idea that he loves them back. I consider myself to be quite truth-seeking and free-thinking. And patriotism that doesn't morph into jingoism or nationalism or militarism can be a healthy thing to have. I never saw or met the driver of that van, but based on the website where I later found the sticker, I suspect the van's owner and I might have a different definition of truth-seeking. And I'm quite sure we have different concepts of what free-thinking means based on the prescriptive nature of items on that list. That sticker was a reminder that what happens at home matters so much. The writer Anne Lamont this past week ventured into this territory, this territory of what it means to be raising another human being. She's a mother who loves her son almost beyond description, but she does not feel that the experience of being a parent has made her better at love than the people who have not been parents. She says she's met many parents who are not good at love at all. And she has some thoughts about prescriptive parenting, parenting that's full of boxes. Here's what she posted a few days ago. It's a little radical. A majority of American parents secretly feel that if you have not had and raised a child, your capacity for love is somehow diminished. They secretly believe that non-parents cannot possibly know what it is to love unconditionally, to be selfless, to put yourself at risk for the gravest loss. But in my experience, she says, it's parents who are prone to exhibit terrible self-satisfaction and selfishness who can raise children as adjuncts, like rooms added on in a remodel. Often their children's value and achievements in the world are reflected glory, necessary for these parents' self-esteem and sometimes for the family's survival. This, she says, is how children's souls are destroyed. I do think her comments get at something we've been talking about the differing ideas of what success looks like in a child. To some parents, success looks like a boy who doesn't want to play with a purple toy purse. It looks like a girl who's happy being a cheerleader and not an athlete. Success looks like a child who accepts the limitations created by a firm gender binary, a binary that is demonstrably and scientifically false. Success is how well everyone follows rules that no one questions. Success is a quashing of creativity. This is how children's souls are destroyed. The good news is that there are a lot of parents who are not like this. Rather, they see the sacred calling of their parenthood as one of stewardship of a young life into its full blossoming, not an industrial process of self-duplication and control. I know these parents, and you do too. We saw them on stage, and we see them all around us this morning. All of these relationships on the micro level of home and family also play out on the macro level of the public square. Last month in my sermon, I mentioned the Feldman test, the four-question quiz about parenting that can, term can determine whether a person has authoritarian tendencies. Questions like whether you think it's more important for a child to have curiosity or good manners. Over decades of studies, survey respondents who choose things like obedience over self-reliance and good manners over curiosity, and who are wary of a child's independence, are more likely to support authoritarian leaders. And I do suspect that these respondents who are parents might be less interested in letting their children grow into who they, into who they are and more interested in making sure their children don't stray outside of certain boxes boxes that make the parents feel comfortable and successful and validate their own choices and way of being. Where I see all this converging is in the states that are most firmly in the grip of authoritarian politicians. States like Tennessee and Idaho and Florida, where it is increasingly scary to be a child. In such places, people and performers whose identities and ways of moving through the world do not correspond to certain narrow and outdated boxes. These folks are being stripped of basic rights, like access to life-saving medical care, or being able to appear in public spaces in whatever gender expression they choose. 
and citizens who have been programmed to believe in obedience and narrow ideas of gender roles are fertile ground for both authoritarianism and transphobia. And this crisis has many layers as we witness the success of anti-democracy movements, the effects on the lives of trans people of all ages, and the loss to society of diversity and creativity and new ways of being. And that, of course, points to the big threat to those who wish to have a rigid, cisgender, patriarchal, greed-based society. Creativity. Creativity is delightfully dangerous. The creativity to live outside the boxes that prop up the systems that we have. The creativity to imagine a world where human flourishing is centered where violence and conquest are never celebrated, where greed is shunned and meeting needs and community is what's exalted. Creativity is so powerful because it can be used to produce art and writing and stories that convey messages of hope and new visions. And creativity can be used to, to strategically plot resistance. And creativity in its most elemental form the bringing into being of something that did not previously exist, that kind of creativity can have profound spiritual benefits. In our 21st century consumer-oriented culture, we are easily divorced from creative processes. Almost everything that we humans used to make for ourselves, food, clothing, shelter, tools, art, music, all these are now created by a minority and purchased by the majority. So it's so easy to forget that we all have the potential to be makers. We risk losing the satisfaction of seeing the fruits of our labors, of bringing something new into the world, and miss out on the healing powers of creating. We can forget that we all have generative power. Fortunately, each of us is a maker. Our opening reading from the Reverend Marcus Liefert reminds us that not only do we have sculptors and painters to thank for what they make, but also those who make jokes and who make coffee and who make the bed. Even if we feel that we lack the skills so often associated with creativity, we can still be makers. We can make room for the stranger. We can make conversation. We can make new friends. Each of us makes something and we all have the power of generativity. As James Baldwin once said, the world is before you, and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. The world is ours for the making. And making need not be a solitary, a solitary venture. Indeed, so much generativity emerges from community and from the spaces we create for each other to explore and flourish. And so I want to leave you with an image of creative expression, of flourishing, of flourishing, an image that happened right here in this very room, just a week ago, right now. Our musicians were making music, wonderful, inspiring, uplifting music of the kind we seem to be blessed with here every Sunday. I don't remember which song they were performing, but I so clearly remember what I could see from up here on the chancel. It was a vision of joy and expressiveness taking place up high beyond the tops of all your heads in the golden light of our balcony. A little girl, one of the youngest members of our community, was literally moved by the music. As glorious sounds filled this room, she got up and she began to dance back and forth, twirling as the melody and spirit inspired her soul moving through the physical space around her to express her enthusiasm. She knew that she was in a safe, nurturing environment where she could embody delight, all because of the loving village arrayed down below in front of her. May we all be as blessed and creative and free. May it be so, and amen. Every week, we have the opportunity to practice our values through sharing our resources. Our pledges are at the core of our spiritual practice of generosity. 
In addition, the church shares half of all non-pledge cash in our offering plate with a community organization. In this way, we commit our resources in line with our belief that this congregation is interdependent with the world beyond these walls. Today, we share the plate with the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is dedicated to building a safer, more inclusive world where all LGBTQ plus young people see a bright future for themselves. LGBTQ plus young people are four times more likely to attempt suicide, and suicide remains the second leading cause of death among young people in the US. May the practice of giving bring us joy. The offering will now be gratefully received. If my words did glow Like the voice of sunshine My tunes were played on the harp Unstrung, would you hear my voice? Our closing words are by Susan L. Van Dresser. Let us sing the magic of imagination by which we know one another and learn the lives of eras gone by. Let us sing the magic of creation by which we build the world of our soul and teach its wisdom to others, young and old. 
Let us sing the magic of our lives together, holding and shaping by the movement of breath from the heart to lung, all new life that is to come. Go now with singing. Go now with magic in your fingertips. Touch this world with life. Will you please now, please now rise in body and spirit for our recessional hymn, number 311 in the Gray Hymnal. Let it be a dance. <laughs> 